All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, Optometric Education Consultants. We're going to be doing neuro pearls tonight. We got Dr. Salka from Center for Sight doing tonight's presentation. And for the for those who don't know, Joe served as the professor of optometry at Novus Southern University College of Optometry for 28 years. While he was here, he served as the chief of advanced care service, the director of glaucoma service in the chair of the Department of Optometric Service. Joe, so is, Joe is all. So the founding member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and the Optometric Retina Society. And at the Academy, he is the chair of neuro, uh, neuro Ophthalmic Disorders in Optometry. And that's at the Academy and that's appropriate that Joe is doing this lecture tonight. If you guys don't know Joe that well, he is a gifted writer with, over, with hundreds of articles published. He is the lead author of the Annual Handbook of Ocular Disease Management, and this is by Review of Optometry. So Joe is a great writer, but you're going to find out tonight that he's also a gifted lecturer. He has lectured nationally and internationally. Joe treat recently, or last year, transitioned from Fort Lauderdale to Sarasota, Florida for Center for Sight. So with that being said, it's an honor and a pleasure, Joe, to be doing this with you and have you tonight. Let's give Joe a big virtual round of applause. Joe, take it away. All right, thanks, Greg. Well, we're gonna be talking about uh, neuro-ophthalmic disease. And what I wanna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna share some pearls with you. I can't tr turn everybody into practicing neuro-ophthalmologist in an hour and 40 minutes, but I think I can try to share some things that will help you with your patients. And a couple of things I want to I want to say is a lot of neuro op is is common sense, and a lot of it's nonsense. You know, I, I see a lot of patients that actually it it's really just nonsense, and it's the art of figuring something out. Now, I may be talking very casually about this, and you may be thinking, well, this is really tough material, but it, it, it's all what one feels comfortable with. I can tell you, if I was on a webinar. And somebody's telling me about scleral lenses and, and how easy scleral lenses are. <laughs> the scleral lenses are the moon to me. But this is something that I kind of gravitate towards in, in my practice. Now, these, this is my disclosure. I'm a, I'm a speaker for Bosch and Loam. Uh, I'm on several advisory boards. But I control the, the content of this. And there's nothing I'm going to talk about that will be influenced by any of my uh, any of my uh, interest. A lot of what we have or I see is actually kind of nonsense. You know, I, you know, two neuro op patients I saw recently, one ended up in the emergency room with steroids in her arm, and the other person got a pair of plus ones in near. So the important thing is know what can kill, maim, and blind immediately. And these are the things I'm, I'm going to try to go over. But once you know these things, and you ruled out the bad stuff, you've actually got some time to figure things out. You know, we don't have to solve all the world's problems in one day. You know, sometimes we can take a moment and think about things, but we need to know what, what the bad things are. And once we rule out the bad things, you know, we got some time to figure it out. Greg, we're going to start right off with a polling question. Which of the following is a neuro-ophthalmic emergency? Is it acute painful ptosis, acute painful vision loss, acute painful double vision, acute painful dilated pupil, or acute painful meiotic pupil? Which of the following is a neuro-ophthalmic emergency? Joe, since you started the, the first polling question, I'll use the sec second polling question to remind myself to, to resend that handout. No worries. I did put it in. People that came in afterwards, you will not see the handout. That's why I'll put it in there again. And we were told that the handout is the older or previous lecture. So we'll get that updated. All right, we got a good, we got a good yeah, response look rate. Look at that, 87%. Thanks everyone for making this live and interactive. We'll share the results. And Joe, I'll let you unshare them or you let me know when you want them okay. to stop. Well, acute painful dilated pupil would receive the most votes, you know, followed by acute painful vision loss, acute painful double vision, 
acute painful ptosis in my other pupil following. So I'm going to stop sharing there. Really, the answer is you're all right. Acute painful anything is a neuroophthalmic emergency. Acute painful ptosis, third nerve palsy, acute painful myotic pupil, corner syndrome carotid dissection, acute painful dilated pupil, aneurysm, acute painful vision loss, giant cell arteritis. Acute painful anything is a neuroophthalmic emergency. Now, here's a very important pearl. I think this might be one of the most important ones I can give you tonight. The urgency of evaluation is really dictated by the duration of the condition. Now, of course, there's always exceptions to the rules, but something that's been there for two hours, vision loss, sudden vision loss for two hours, you've got two hours to figure it out. Double vision for a week, you got a week to figure it out. Uh, something for that's been there for six months, you got six months to figure out. Something that's been there for two years, you know, send the patient home, you, you're bothering me, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with you. Here's a case, he's a 46 year old male who reports waking up three months ago, not being able to see in his right, out of his right eye. He's light perception of the right eye, 20-20 left eye. He's got disc pal in the right eye. No other concurrent findings. Now, his last medical exam is unknown. He doesn't have any medical history. He's a kind of a typical middle-aged male that he denies everything and doesn't go to the doctor. Now, this is actually seen by one of my residents, and she got nervous. She didn't call me or text me. I was I wasn't on the floor. She was in a different location. And she sent the patient right to the emergency room. Question is, how long do we have to get this worked up? You know, patient's been light has been light perception for three months. My estimation, we have three months to figure this out. And there's there's nothing, there's nothing new, there's nothing urgent here. And just sending to the emergency room without helping them is not really acceptable. I can tell you anything like this that gets sent to the emergency room, the number one thing, the, th the thing they will do is a non-contrast enhanced CT of the brain. Why? They're looking for intracranial bleed. After that, they are dismissed the patient. So sending to the emergency department is actually reasonable if you're willing to help them. Now, neuroophthalmic urgencies and emergencies. We got giant cell arteritis, which is any sudden vision loss in the elderly. Pituitary apoplexy, these are people who present with headache, field loss, and double vision, though that can be highly variable. Aneurysms, which we're gonna talk about pupil involvement. Papilledema, which is at best a clinical suspicion it is not a clinical diagnosis. We cannot diagnose papilledema until we know the intracranial pressure is elevated. And carotid dissection manifesting as a Horner syndrome. Greg, that brings right to polling question number two already. What is the most important diagnosis to consider when encountering any sudden vision loss in the elderly? Is it giant cell arteritis? Or is it the correct answer above giant cell arteritis? And this should so, be a pretty quick one. So Joe, as this is rolling in, I'm getting uh, a uh, chats in the chat box about Nova S Southeastern. University Correct. of Optometry, I guess I said Southern, so I'm being politely corrected here. So Joe, you served 28 years at the Professor of Optometry at Nova Southeastern University of Optometry. I probably did say Southern, but I know it's Southeastern. Well, I was hoping to one day get 100% of the correct answer, but unfortunately I couldn't only give one choice. Now, a top neuro-ophthalmologist, Dr. Andy Lee, said, when dealing with sudden vision loss in the elderly, there's five things to consider. The first thing is giant cell arteritis, and the other four things are giant cell arteritis. So someone picked up in the chat box on that, Joe. Kyle said, first 100% response, question mark. Yes, that's what I always wanted. All right, she's a 66-year-old female who has new sudden onset vision loss. Now, when I say elderly, let, let's qualify that. Um, my definition of elderly used to be anybody older than me, people, young people or younger than me. That's been changing as time goes on. 
I think that elderly, we have to consider age 50 or above. No offense to anybody. Now, she has 2,400 acuity, because, but she has a long-standing macular scar, but she did notice inferior vision loss. She did notice there was a change. And she had a new onset inferior arcuate scotoma. Now, look here, right eye, she had some disc edema, a little bit of pallor, no hemorrhages, no tail and jectatic vessels on the disc. And the left eye had a small, crowded optic nerve, disc at risk, less than 0.2 CD ratio. She had mild headache that was, you know, relieved by over-the-counter. It wasn't even every day. She did Im admit to a little bit of malaise and loss of appetite. She lost about seven pounds over, over the previous four weeks. She's got no jaw claudication, no temporal head pain. She's not in really acute distress. I, mean, I can tell you this was a normal looking woman. She it would be a, a typical Sarasota suburbanite, you know, very, very fit woman uh, in their inner in tennis outfit. And the question is, what, you know, what do you do in a situation like this? I mean, she doesn't have a gangbuster history, but it's vision loss sudden in an older person. This is exactly the kind of person we have to evaluate. And I can tell you right now, her said rate was 96. I had sent, we sent her to, I sent her right to the emergency room, told them exactly what we're looking for, what to do. Said rate came back as 96. CRP came back a little bit later. It was indeed elevated. Got a call. This was, this happened 3.30 on a Friday afternoon. Uh, by the time I was out having dinner with my wife, I got a call from the ER physician who told me this and said, okay, what do we do next? What, what's the dosing? And I told him the dosing was uh, a gram of solumedrol uh, in her arm, try to get half of that in before midnight. And uh, that saved her vision. Any acute vision loss in the eye is giant cell to proven otherwise. You know, she had an ischemic, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. You know, it can be arteritic or non-arteritic. In the, in the non-arteritic form, you've got arteriosclerotic uh, disease and microvascular features that are contributing, whereas an autoimmune vasculitis is contributing to the arteritic form. It's typically a unilateral presentation. There's a high incidence of subsequent contralateral involvement, especially if it's arteritic. Bilateral involvement will happen in 65% of patients on an average of about 10 days. And this is not a disease we wanna make a, a diagnosis of when they lose vision in their fellow eye. Kind of fortunately, this patient, her, her poor vision eye was the one that was involved, not her good eye. And looking at it, arteritic ischemic neuropathies tend to be swollen and pale, whereas non-arteritic tend to be swollen and hyperemic due to the teal and jactatic uh, dilatation of the disc capillaries trying to reperfuse the infarcted part of that nerve. And that's not going to happen with arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy because the blood flow is cut off quite a bit uh, before that in the, in the ciliary circulation. And of course, you're gonna have a disc at risk uh, in the, the non-arteritic form. But the caveat is even patients with small crowded optic nerves can develop giant cell arteritis. So non-arteritic ischemic neuropathies are risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, in the small crowded hyperemic disc at risk atherosclerotic diseases, smoking, sometimes after cataract surgery. And they usually prevent, present with an inferior, six to one will be inferior arcuate, not an altitudinal defect, but an arcuate defect like you see in, in glaucoma. Now these patients can progressively get worse over several days and there is a potential for some visual recovery at about six months. The earliest I've ever encountered this in any form was age 37. This is usually early 40s and beyond, and it is a painless disease. It's very important. There's really no pain involved. In contrast, arteritic ischemic neuropathies have a pallid swelling. Sometimes there's flame-shaped hemorrhages, arterial uh, attenuation, and nerve fiber layer infarcts in the form of cotton wool spots. Unexplained cotton wool spots in the elderly should prompt the consideration for giant cell arteritis. 
Now, these people have pain of some sort, jaw pain, head pain, neck pain, girdle pain, and that, that usually has some degree of discomfort. And it's a severe optic nerve dysfunction, whereas the visual field defects, like non-arteritic being inferior, usually cannot be assessed with formal perimetry because the, uh, the vision is so poor. Now, giant cell arteritis and polymyalgia rheumatica are both risk factors for arteritic ischemic neuropathy. And one can argue that PMR and GCA are different ends of the spectrum of the same rheumatological autoimmune uh, disease process. Typically in the 70s, it's not that common under the age of 60, but for any patient over the age of 50, this is always on the menu. Greg, we got to remember that for ourselves too. You know, anybody over the age of 50, this is on the menu. And I said, there's a high risk of bilateral involvement. So we have to have a very good history and we have to ask about the non-visual symptoms. Headache, to some degree, is present over 90% of these patients. They can also complain of scalp pain, jaw claudication, ear pain, temporal pain, malaise, intermittent fevers or fever of unknown origin. Of course, we're going to do our examination. If we see, you know, the ischemic neuropathies, we're going to see the, we see artery occlusion, central artery occlusions, cotton wool spots. We have to consider that that's the disease we're dealing with. Now, lab studies, said rate C reactive protein, if you want to be uh, extra cautious, uh, platelets. You know, said rate is going to be lowered by statins and NSAIDs, and a lot of these older people are, are on these, these medicines. And they're going to be giving you a false, a false negative. But the C-reactive protein really isn't, uh, isn't affected by the statins and NSAIDs. And the two together are, are really pretty sensitive for this disease. Now, the initial symptoms, and it's based upon a, a study looking at GCA, headache, polymyalgia rheumatica. Now, sometimes they actually have this diagnosis made. Or we can, you know, we don't ask the patient, you know, do you, do you have joint aches? Because they're all going to say yes. But remember, chair and stair, it's difficult for them to get out of the chair. It is hard for them to walk up stairs. You can throw in hair. It hurts when they comb their hair. I used to say fair because we consider this to be a Caucasian disease. That information came from population studies in Minnesota where most of the patients were, were Caucasian, but studies uh, out of the Baltimore uh, area shows that people of color and Caucasian are affected by this disease re relatively uh, equally. But hair, chair and stare, these, these are the muscles that they use and that are mostly affected by polymyalgia rheumatica. Visual symptoms without vision loss, transient ischemic attacks. They, they have a transient loss of, of vision in one eye. They have transient diplopia, but none was happening during the exam. They often have weakness, malaise, and fatigue. Now, what is common uh, to all these things? Yeah, they present with a normal exam. The exam's normal, but the symptoms are there. Vision loss and ocular findings, arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, in about 5 to 10% of cases, central retinal artery occlusion. Now, if the vision is an epic fail and the optic nerve actually looks normal, you're dealing with a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And that normal, normal nerve with afferent defect and poor vision in the elderly is not optic neuritis and is not multiple sclerosis, is posterior ischemic optic neuropathy which is really associated with giant cell arteritis. Transient ischemic attacks, these happen in about 25% of patients about six weeks before they actually have an occlusive event that is permanent. And transient diplopia. You know, they, they, they complain of double vision, but they may not have double vision in the office. And the reason, most likely, it's actually ischemia to the muscles extracted muscle and not the extract and not the uh, ocular nerves. Headache and pain in giant cell, we can see where the, the vascular distribution is and the pain is non-localizing. It can be scalp pain, 
We can have ear pain, you know, lingual artery and the facial artery being involved. We can have uh, jaw pain, accept, the occipital artery being involved, we have occipital pain. You know, it can really be widespread. And we have to consider that this whole vascular tree could be uh, involved. So making the diagnosis, we look at the prodromal sim, you know, symptoms. Sed rate C reactive protein uh, are very sensitive when, when used together. And it's important to get everything. Even, even the platelet uh, count uh, will be elevated. Of course, ophthalmoscopy and sometimes fluorescent angiography will show non-filling of the choroid. And temporal artery biopsy is a, is a very important test, but it is not always accurate. It's very important to understand that you may have to still diagnose this disease in the face of a, a negative temporal artery biopsy. I think we all know or heard about skip lesions. Well, it's not just skip lesions. It's the pathologist not reading the biopsy right. Or, you know, I, I'm involved as an expert witness in a case of temporal arteritis that had a negative biopsy that when specimens were sent to the a university and somebody else looked at it and said, yeah, there is evidence of, of giant cell. But, you know, actually really kind of look at, at the report. You have to read, you know, we don't read so the slides, read the report. You know, it'll come back, no giant cell, no active arteritis. But if it actually says in there, focal interruption of the internal elastic lamina, that's a healed arteritis and that vessel has been affected and they still have the disease, yet it's a negative biopsy. And sometimes, just quite frankly, sometimes people biopsy the wrong vessel. And the pathology report comes back, you know, that says, you know, temporal vein is uh, completely normal, you, you idiot. So these are patients who, who really need IV steroids uh, when they have vision loss and, and hydration. It's very effective in preventing second eye involvement. Sometimes it actually brings back vision, the involved eye. And this is, is best done through the ER. They really need it to be admitted because that way we're sure they're getting the, uh, they're getting the steroids. And if they ask you, it's 250 milligrams solumedrol four times a day for three days, followed by orals, and that's been pretty effective in, in, in stemming the vision loss from this disease. So I always think arteritic when you have all these findings happening. Now, sometimes they get asked, you know, if you're sure or you really think you've got a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, do I really still need to do the test? And the answer is yes, unless you're dealing with somebody who's in their, like in their 40s or, or, or late 30s or early 40s where it's not likely to be giant cell arteritis, you really should do it. I mean, if you end up with a patient who, who, who truly has giant cell arteritis in their 40s and they go bilaterally blind, you'll become famous just for the wrong reasons. That's why I call Dick Rowe famous. And if Greg reminds me, we may, we may talk about that at the very end, who Dick Rowe is. But yeah, we need to get the test done because non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy is diagnosed in the negative, not what it is, what it isn't. And how do you diagnose it? By proving it's not arteritic. So the tests are important. So clinical pearl, remember the E's in GCA. They're elderly, the ESR is elevated. They only see the big E on the I chart and it is an E emergency. So that covers actually one of the top neuro-op urgencies and emergencies, giant cell arteritis, any sudden vision loss in the elderly. Greg, anything come through I should be aware of? Yes, a uh, question came in. Uh, Gregory asks, when you order the solumedrol, do you still get the temporal artery biopsy right question mark? The answer is yes. And I'm not ordering it. I'm working right. with an, e an ER physician to order this. She or he will do it. I will guide them if necessary, I tell them what test. And the answer is yes, they do need a biopsy. You've got about at least a week to get it done. But keep in mind, mistakes get made on biopsies. They, they biopsy the wrong vessel. They don't, the pathologist doesn't read it right. Sometimes we still have to forge ahead even though the biopsy is negative. He also had a patient that reported throat pain. Pharyngitis, common. 
unexplained flu-like illness. We can't blame everything on COVID right now, even though we'd like to. So pharyngitis is also a very common finding. Sensory neural hearing loss is also a fine. Night sweats, fever of known unknown origin are all very common findings. The, uh, there's another one that came in, weakness in, in chewing, same as jaw pain. So is weakness in chewing the same as jaw pain? Yes. And let's say jaw claudication, not jaw pain. Because pain may mean something sharp to a patient like a toothache. Jaw claudication, it's more a fatigue and ache, like they're chewing beef jerky or they're chewing a, a tough steak. So don't say jaw pain, but always consider the fact that it may be a dull ache or fatigue. These are all excellent questions. Anything else, Greg? Yeah, there's one more in here and it says, what is a normal ESR? That's a darn good question, and it's a it's a it's a hard one to answer. Here, here's what we all learn. This is our our, our approach. For for men, for for men, it is basically men or women. It's age divided by two. So if they're if they're ninety, it goes up to forty five. Now, when you get when you get your your said rate results, the Western again, it'll say zero to twenty. So what we know, what we've been taught clinically, it's around you know up to around forty in the elderly. Your lab your lab tests are going to say twenty. So now you hit around twenty five or thirty, and you think it's normal by what you're taught, but in black and white it says it's abnormal. You're really compelled to act on it, and that's why we have to do the history. Look at the set, look at the at the uh, platelet count. Look at the C reactor protein as well. So, Joe, whenever we talk about this, ESR goes up, platelets go up, the C reactor protein goes up, but hemoglobin typically goes down. So that's kind of the four things I look at, and I just mentioned it to the audience that if you're getting a CBC. You know, you want to look at hemoglobin, look at platelets. If you get the, you know, obviously you're going to get ESR and a C-reactive protein and be careful, make sure you get a C-reactive protein that is quantitative, not qualitative, yes or no. You want to see the number so you can kind of piece those four together. And to me, two of those that are positive in a patient that we're talking about here, that definitely warrants getting off to the, uh, to the appropriate person. So. I did put the uh, handout in the chat box again. That's the second time. Uh, I did get confirmation from our IT person that the link was incorrect to the current. You know, so it was a previous webinar. It's been updated. So the post event emails, it will be fine. Um, so uh, that's all should be resolved. And again, it's in the chat box. All yours, Joe. All right, she's a 28 year old female who has visual gray outs, not blackouts, but gray outs and bilateral, uh, intermittent horizontal double vision, and a chronic headache's been worsening over two weeks. You know, she com complains of white coat hypertension. She has an injury uh, to her shoulder for which she's using a muscle relaxant. She's five foot three, 220 pounds. Uh, her neuroocular screening is all normal. And she has bilaterally swollen optic nerves with these juxtapapillary folds in the retina known as Patton's folds. She still has some preservation of the cup. That brings me to polling question number three, Greg. What's the most likely diagnosis? Is it pseudotumor? Is it real tumor? Is it idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Or I don't know. That's why I'm here. We have another question in here, Joe, while we're waiting for that to happen. It says BCP question mark. On this patient? No. No, no. I, um, it came in at 736. So I'm not sure of where that... plugs in getting a good response here mm -hmm. indeed and 
one or two more and we'll end the poll. We'll have a nice yeah, call live, here. Live and interactive. There we go. So almost equal pseudotumor and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Some people said a real tumor and a few people said, I don't know, that's why I'm here, which is a legitimate answer. Now she's got a dull ring in her ears. Her blood pressure is elevated, but not in a malignant hypertension sort of way. Uh, everything is uh, in the exam is pretty much unremarkable. She has a blind spot enlargement and a nasal step defect in each eye and visual field. Serologically, she was normal. Imaging showed small ventricles, otherwise uh, normal. Her opening pressure was 510, which should be about two, no more than 250. There's no blood, there's no white blood cells. Her CSF studies were all normal and she was diagnosed with pseudotumor cerebri. But realistically, she actually had papilledema. So let's go, let's talk about papilledema, then we'll hone it into pseudotumor. Bilateral disc edema is the rule. I've only seen one case of unilateral uh, papilledema due to a brain tumor. It affects the superior and inferior aspects of the disc first, much like glaucoma. There can be an obliteration of the cup over time. Uh, hemorrhages can be common. There will typically be no spontaneous venous pulsation, though I can't say I really ever noticed that in, in most patients. And those juxtapapillary folds or patents folds of advancing and regressing edema tend to be uh, really diagnostic or, or pointing toward a direct, uh, direction of true papilledema. There's no afferent defect typically, and the visual is usually very normal. Visually, they can have trans visual obscurations and sometimes around 20 times per day, and intermittent horizontal double vision from sixth nerve palsy, either unilateral or bilateral. Headache is common, nausea and vomiting or, not, or vomiting without nausea can occur, uh, particularly if there's, if there's increased intracranial pressure from a mass lesion. Dizziness and tinnitus are all potentials. Now, papilledema has a couple of different types. There's acute, there's chronic, and there's atrophic. Acute in the lower left, hemorrhages, it's very wet, exudation, the nerve is very hyperemic, nerve fiber layer edema. This is something that's relatively uh, a recent onset. Chronic is what we see in the, in the middle. Minimal hemorrhages, minimal exudate, collateral vessels may be present due to the congestion of the disc. In the far right, uh, we have atrophic papilledema. The nerve becomes very pale, very swollen, uh, very pale, but not very swollen because it's dying. Dead things just don't swell. It actually begins to flatten out. The disc edema is from axoplasmic stasis because there's a regurgitation of metabolic waste products because cerebral edema is being transmitted along the meningeal sheaths of the brain into the optic nerve subarachnoid space, producing the engorged swollen optic discs, usually plural. And papilledema, increased intracranial pressure, can be to increase brain volume from a mass lesion that we see down here causing midline shift. Increased blood volume, as we see here in intracranial bleed, or an increased cerebral spinal fluid volume, as we see in the lower right in the hydrocephalic state. Now, a tumor doesn't have to be as large as we see in the left in order to, to block flow between the, the, the ventricles and lead to a hydrocephalic state. Now, it's important to rule out the masqueraders, uh, ultrasound, fundus autofluorescence, uh, OCT can help identify optic nerve drusen, you know, look for abnormal branching patterns uh, uh, of the vessels, all indicating you have a really just a anomalous nerve. Now, acute papilledema is going to be a medical emergency. We're going to need immediate neuroimaging to rule out an intracranial mass. Now, I'm not talking about the, the nerve where it looked like, is it normal? Is it not normal? Is it swollen? I'm talking about the clear cases of, of true bilateral disc edema. We got to consider papilledema, which is a clinical suspicion. 
and it could be infection, it could be bleed, it could be brain tumor. So we need immediate neural imaging to rule out a mass. If the imaging is normal, lumbar puncture to, to see what the CSF pressure is and make sure there's no infective process going on. Now, atrophic papilledema, significant vision and field loss is also an urgency because the patient's going blind. We, we have to take uh, urgent measures to prevent blindness. And suspected papilledema with any neurologic abnormalities, fever, stiff neck uh, can indicate uh, an intracranial infection. And this also needs emergency medical attention. Where is, but, where is this all best to be done? In the emergency room. But tell the emergency room physicians what you're thinking of and what to look for and what your considerations are. Now, I think this is, Greg, this is your part, your favorite part of the song. When I talk about pseudotumor versus IIH, everybody thinks that IIH is the current term and pseudotumor is the old term, and they are not mutually exclusive. Pseudotumor means increased intracranial pressure, but there's no tumor. But there are other causes of agents, venous sinus thrombosis, hypercoagula. Uh, coagulable states, oral contraceptive use, uh, oral tetracycline use, vitamin A uh, overuse. These are all things that have been associated with pseudotumor. Now, when, that, when none of this is present and we have the typical young, overweight female and there's no other cause that has been identified, no, no medication use, no venous sinus thrombosis, now we call that IIH or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, or it is primary pseudotumor. Whereas if there's a causative agent, it is secondary pseudotumor. So both are good terms, but we don't technically use the term IIH in a 17 year old boy who's using minocycline. That's a secondary pseudotumor. And this all comes from poor CSF drainage. So diagnosing pseudotumor, we have to have signs and symptoms consistent with increased intracranial pressure and papilledema and the disc edema may be subtle when you see the patient. They also have to have a normal neurologic exam. The only thing they can allow or they can have is six nerve paresis because with the increased intracranial pressure, the brain stem is herniating down through frame and magnum. It stretches the sixth nerve across the clivus and they get the horizontal double vision. Neuroimaging has to be normal, no hydrocephalus, no mass, no blood, no structural lesion, no venous sinus thrombosis. And the CSF has to be normal. There can't be any blood, no white cells, no, no fungus in there. And the LP has to be elevated. You know, in adults, it's usually over, over 250. Now, it's harder to get lumbar punctures done. And lumbar puncture may be deferred based upon the neuroimaging, because some of the neuroimaging findings are really pretty distinct. First off, the MRI and the MRV, magnetic resonance veneography, which must also be done, can show no abnormalities. But an MRI, you can actually see an empty cell of tersica. And the cell of tersica houses the pituitary gland, which is very gelatinous. And the increased inter in cranial pressure kind of squashes it down. <clears throat> so it looks like there's no, nothing in the cell of tersica. Also, if you look at it, it's very easy to identify. The back of the optic of the globes look flattened, like they're, they're squashed in. So flattening of the globes, nothing else wrong, no venous sinus thrombosis, empty cell of tersica. These are so characteristic that if there's nothing else going on, lumbar puncture may not be done. No, no fever or evidence of an infection. And they have a typical patient profile. Lumbar puncture may not be done. And that doesn't mean that the patient is being mistreated. Now managing this patient, no visual loss, right? they're treated for headache. Acetazolamide, which is not an easy drug to take three times a day at a gram and a half. And weight, eight and weight reduction. That, you know, that's the important thing. Take, taking weight off about 10%. I've heard as low as five, but 10% will actually help with this disease. 
if they've got mild vision loss, of course, acetazolamide, but there's also furosemide, topiramate, zanistamide, or all the other diuretics that can be used, and of course, weight reduction. Now, with no or mild vision loss, the prognosis is really good if we address the intracranial pressure, we address the weight, um, they're going to get better in you know six to nine months. But of course, we have to follow them up with visual fields and OCT and photography. Because once the patient's downstream from us, none of these tests are going to get done. And it's imperative that we look at it because we're the ones that are going to tell if the patient's getting better or worse. Now, weight loss, about 10%. You know, 165 pound woman or, or, or man, well, woman, has to lose six, 16 and a half pounds. A 220 pound person, 22 pounds. <clears throat> Sometimes you need di dietitians and primary care physicians to help. Now here's a 17 year old. Uh, her, her BMI is not all that high. And what do we, you know, what what do we see here? Bilaterally swollen optic nerves, obscuration of the superior and inferior vessels, obliteration of the cup, enlarged blind spots. <clears throat> what we see here on the uh, on the serous OCT is this red, white, and blue pattern, which we call the Patriot sign, which tells you've got some juxtapapillary edema. Remember that Patriot sign. She's a 30-year-old female, horizontal double vision, headaches, and transient visual obscurations 20 times per day. No oral contraceptives, no tetracyclines, no vitamin A. She had lost about 10 pounds and noticed that her headaches had improved. And this is very characteristic. These are people, they put on some pounds, they get headaches. They lose, lose weight, headaches get better. And that helps spur them on to, uh, to further weight loss. Now her BMI is not all that high. She's five foot five, 160, BMI 26. And what we see here is bilateral. And you know, she had a, she had a unilateral six nerve palsy as well. A bilateral disc edema, where we got obscurations of the vessels. This looks fairly chronic. You know, there's no hemorrhage or exudate we see here. She has a bit of an enlarged blind spot in each eye. She has a superior arcuate defect uh, in, the, in the right eye and very swollen optic nerves. We can see right here the Patriot sign on the serous OCT. And this is a person who underwent the neuroimaging that was required. Uh, she had elevated opening pressure on lumbar puncture. She had all the characteristic findings. And she was diagnosed with pseudotumor or primary pseudotumor IIH, was instructed to lose weight, put on Diamox. And over the period of time, and these are people you, you're going to look at it probably every three months for the first year, then every six months for the next year. Everything's going well, probably on an annual basis. And what we can see with photography between two visits, there is reducing edema. And it's very important to take the picture. And, and here's why. If I look at that picture, I say, yeah, there's disc edema. I look at this one here, I see there's disc edema. But when I have phot photographs, I can compare it. I can see it's getting better. Therapy is working. And we can see the field defect has improved. Now imagine if I turn these arrows around and we went from this field to that field and this disc to this disc. Now I tell the primary care physician, the neurologist, you know, it's getting worse. And this is where we need to get involved. We need to be involved in the care of these patients. So we have to do the follow-up because nobody's doing photographs, nobody's doing visual fields, nobody's doing OCTs, that's gonna be up to us. We're the ones who are gonna definitively say the patient's doing better or the patient's doing worse. Now they get severe or progressive visual loss. And these are people who are going blind. They, can, they benefit from optic nerve sheath decompression. They actually cut open the sheath so the cerebral spinal fluid can just leak out. High dose IV steroids and IV acetazolamide can be used, but most of these patients, you know, that's not a long-term therapy. They will need a diversion procedure such as a limboperitoneal shunt uh, where it drains uh, to another part of the body. 
And this is for people who have failed optoneurve sheath uh, penetration, or, or they can't do or they have intractable headache. Here's an important clinical pearl. IAH is a slowly progressive condition until it's not. And there is a subset of pseudotumor or a subset of IIH, which many people are not aware of, and that's called fulminant IIH. This is the same disease. It's the same diagnostic criteria for IIH or pseudotumor. However, it's actually a prog rapidly progressive condition. There's less than four weeks between the onset of symptoms and loss of field or acuity. And they can have vision worsening rapidly over several days. These are people that need emergency procedures. They typically need a CSF diversion uh, surgery, such as, as lumboperitoneal shunt, optic nerve sheath fenestration. These are ones we don't have a lot of time for. We have to get them into the emergency room and help the ER physicians contract with either neurosurgery orbital surgery or neurology. So IH is slow until it's not and becomes fulminant. We find out their, their symptoms started a few weeks ago and they already have very significant field loss or, or even acuity loss. Fulminant IIH is a subset of pseudotumor, which is actually relentlessly rapidly progressive. That knocks off one of our emergencies, papilledema. Greg, is there anything I should be aware of in the chat room? Yep, there is a couple of questions that have come in. And okay. I had a, a thin eight-year-old female with pseudotumor cerebri. Uh, is this rare, question mark? The, the answer is, it's uncommon. I won't say rare, it's uncommon. It would be more common if it was a thin eight-year-old boy. A thin eight-year-old girl, a little bit more uncommon, but it does happen. So children, not in the typical profile, it does happen. Is it possible to get pseudotumor from minocycline? The answer is yes. And Greg, I know, I know you've seen that numerous times. Yeah. And, I, and I'll just kind of just take it a step further and just say, you know, we work in a practice that has five ODs and we pretty much see it on a quarterly basis. We see it anywhere uh, from you know, teenagers to adults using minocycline or doxycycline for, uh, for usually uh, acne. Um, and I usually post those on ODs on Facebook just to remind everyone that uh, these medications can cause uh, swollen nerve heads. Uh, does cranial nerve six palsy resolve after pseudotumor, pseudotumor cerebri treatment? The answer is by and large, yes, it does. Are all pseudotumor cerebri patients overweight? No. No, sometimes the BMI, it, you know, doesn't really fall into the obese category as we, we've seen. Uh, it can happen in skinny 10-year-old boys. It can happen in people who are, you know, more modest, you know, slightly, I guess we can call Rubenesque, but uh, not grossly overweight. So you, you can have a, a normal profile in these patients as well. And then one last one, and we'll let you get cranking again, is I thought ONSD was studied and found to be non-efficacious. It's not efficacious for, it's not, it, it is not efficacious for non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. That has been shown, but it is actually a rescue procedure for, for pseudotumor. Excellent one, questions all. And one just rolled in. Are there any adverse side effects aware of with the use of Diamox? Adverse, well, it, it can cause kidney stone formation in people who have sickling disorders. It can prompt a sickle crisis because it affects the acid-base uh, balance. It just ma it makes people feel really, really poorly. And there are some rare, you know, rare allergic responses where Diamox can actually cause uh, angle closure glaucoma. Yeah, and just a few that I'll just throw out there is kind of the nausea, the drowsiness, kind of that numbness feeling that's out there that patients get by using it. That's more of, you know, a side effect rather than maybe a, an adverse bad complication, but those are the things that, that can happen. 
All right, Joe, we're up to speed. All right. He's a 63-year-old Indian male. He's one of my long, he was one of my long-standing glaucoma patients who has a sudden onset of orbital pain for three days duration. He's diabetic and hypertensive, well controlled. On Coumadin with a pacemaker, kind of an important part of the story. He's got no vision change and he comes in on a Monday for an emergency glaucoma evaluation where this begins on a Friday, gets worse on a Saturday, very bad on a Sunday. And Monday he comes in because I'm his eye doctor. And he looks like this and we can clearly see he's got a partial ptosis. And this is all new. He's never looked like this before. And we can see from the eye that's peeking out, it's sort of exo uh, deviated and hypo deviated. So he's down and out. And we lift up, he cannot look up, he cannot look down. He cannot AD duct, but he can fully abduct his eye. When you look at his pupils, he's got a two millimeter responsive pupil on the left. He has got a five millimeter unresponsive pupil on the right. And he clearly has a third, or I should say a partial third neuropalsy with pupil involvement. And we have to consider that this is a patient who has got a mass lesion on his, op on his third cranial nerve. And out of all the mass lesions that happen, you got that one, Greg? Got I it. I, I got enjoying, it. I was enjoying that. I was kind of just trying to figure out what that actually meant. <laughs> we have to consider an aneurysmal third nerve palsy. And this is exactly, you know, my thought. And this whole exam was, was 10 minutes. And mostly what it was, it was education. Explain to the patient and his wife uh, what, was, what was wrong. And this is the kind of situation that we really need to send right to the emergency department. I offered them an ambulance. Because as I explained, if this aneurysm ruptures, which I, I mean, I, 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 I'm strongly suspecting an aneurysm, if it ruptures, you'll be in the best situation to be stabilized. And they declined. They said that, you know, she said she would take him right to the emergency room. So I actually wrote down, a uh, note, patient has right third nerve palsy with pupil involvement, suspect posterior communicating artery aneurysm, needs to see uh, neurosurgery stat. And I can tell you, as I was explaining, writing this down and explaining things, his wife was becoming quite anxious. And I knew the question was coming and the question came, she said, how much will this all cost? We don't have insurance. And my response was, it doesn't matter how much it costs, he's going to die. You don't walk this off, it doesn't get better. He'll go home, he'll lay down, he'll become comatose, and then it'll be too late. I will, I will, I will tell you that from, from the time I said that, 45 minutes later, I got a call on my cell phone. He was already in a CT scanner. Now, why was he in a CT scanner? I mean, pacemaker, you can't get, can't get an MRI. Coumadin, if he starts to bleed, he's not going to stop bleeding. He was actually hospitalized for 23 days to tell you how sick he was. And he underwent two neurosurgical procedures where they packed the aneurysm with coils and probably put a stent in there as well. And he did survive. He's got the secondary aberrant regeneration. I can tell you right now, if he walked into anybody's office and didn't share this history, you get very nervous. He, his ptosis is almost completely resolved. He cannot adduct, he cannot elevate, he cannot depress, and his pupil is still fixed. You're looking at a third nerve palsy. It's just that it's a patient with third nerve palsy who has undergone two neurosurgical interventions, and he is as treated as he's going to be. And, you know, he's, you know, he is, of course, still alive and he has done, you know, he has done well for, uh, for many years. I'm going to say, I'm thinking about at least 10 years, but I can tell you for a long time, he is on, on narcotics for that, for pain, for the, from this disease. These are people who are very sick. It's an eye that's down and out with a ptosis, with adduction, elevation, depression, deficits, and patients may be isochoric or anisochoric, and I'll talk more about what all that means in just a second. Here's a patient, here's a case. He's an 83-year-old male. I didn't get involved in his case until follow-up. 
I didn't see him initially. Now, believe it or not, if we look in the upper left, he has actually got a ptosis, which is really hard to differentiate the ptosis from the dermatochelasis. He is a diabetic. His last blood sugar was in the 300s. His A1C is probably around 11. So we take a look at him at this point. What do we see? Complete ptosis. Lift the lid. He cannot look up, cannot look down, cannot adduct his eye, but he can abduct his eye. And he has normal symmetrical pupils. Now, this is a person before I actually saw him, he came in with a partial third nerve palsy, which is itself problematic. And imaging, neuroimaging was done through his primary care physician. Now, I imagine the, the clinicians who were involved in this uh, probably discussed this with the primary care physician. Pro I'm sure mentioned aneurysm and probably overwhelmed the PCP with a lot of jargon that was not uh, familiar. And they probably said, yeah, but he's a bad diabetic, so this is probably ischemic. And that was the one word that the internist heard. So when he ordered it, you know, the I, I, I got the report back. When I looked at the report, it said indication for imaging brain ischemia. There are two errors that were made here. What were the two? Does anybody know what the two errors were? You can put it in the chat box. There are two mistakes that were made here in terms of the testing and imaging. Anybody know? Okay. Sometimes people put it in the chat, that's okay. I'll tell you the two things. First off, indication for imaging, brain ischemia. I can guarantee you this person's gonna have brain ischemia. Why he's 83 years old. Everybody at this age, male or female has small vessel brain, small vessel disease and microvascular infarcts. It's what I call little old man and little old lady disease. They all have it. But if you're looking for brain ischemia, the radiologist might not see the aneurysm that could be there. So not telling them what to look for is error number one. Error number two, they did an MRI. In order to find an aneurysm, which begins with an A, what you use has to have an A in it. There is no A in MRI. You need an MRA or a CTA, and this is what you need to find it. So these are two mistakes that were made here. And here's a pearl. The world's best neuroradiologists cannot help you if you don't order the scan, order the correct scan, and tell them what to look for. That is our role. Now, I'm gonna give you a little primer here, neuroimaging for the primary care optometrist and primary care ophthalmologist. Here's this quote, I don't read MRIs. There are ODs that probably do. Kelly Malloy comes to mind, Len Messner, James Finelli, uh, Kelsey Moody, Aaron Draper, uh, Len Messer. These are people that can probably read there. I don't do it. My belief in neuroradiology is what you don't know can hurt you a whole lot. That's the reason they have residencies in radiology and subspecialties in neuroradiology. Thinking that I'm as good as they are is irresponsible to me. I was working a program. I had, I had the chief of neuroradiology from Johns Hopkins, and he was putting up images. I wish... I, he identified the ciliary body on an MRI. I had a hardest time trying to teach optometry students to do it with gonioscopy. He could see the ciliary body and the angle on an MRI. That's how good they are. So rules for eye care physicians, order the correct scan and read the report to make sure they did what you wanted them to do. If they didn't do it, they got to do it again. I don't look at the films. Never going to look at the films. I'll look at the report to make sure they did what I asked them to do. If you have questions, doubts, or concerns, reach out to the radiology. Ask for a repeat. Yeah, you know, my wife during her residency had a patient she thought had Telosa Hunt syndrome. The MRI came back as normal. So she called the radiologist and was talking to him, and she said, "May I, may I just you know request a neuroradiologist to to look at this scan?" And he snaps back and my wife says, 
I am a neuroradiologist. And he started to, to chastise her. And then he said, well, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah okay. You know, there, there is a little something here in, in the cavern. Or I mean, he looked at it again and he changed his, uh, his report. You know, form a relationship with an imaging center. Find out about the practice. You know, you may find out sometimes they have better results with MRA and sometimes they have better results with CTA. But, I, you know, just reach out and, and form a relationship with an imaging center. You know, it makes it a whole lot easier. So here, here is, I think I'll spend a little time here. This is a cheat sheet that I'm going to give to you what to order, how, and why. If you've been dozing or watching the football game, this is one you may want to pay a little bit more attention to because I'm going to try to break it down and make it simple. If you have disc edema and you suspect papilledema, what do they need? Brain MRI with and without contrast, looking for mass lesion, hydrocephalus, hemorrhage, flattened globe, empty cell. They need an MRV looking for venous sinus thrombosis. Order these two tests just like that and write these things down. Tell them what to look for. Optic nerve or chiasmal disease. They need an MRI of the orbits and chiasm, not brain. That's separate. Orbits and chiasm and brain are two different things. Now, when you do orbits and chiasm, of course, they cut through the brain. When you do brain, of course, they cut through the orbits and chiasm. But they're two different. They're looking at doing it two different. So that is separate. You need MRI orbits and chiasm with and without contrast with fat suppression. Why? Fat glows white. Things that happen to the optic nerve, such as nerve enhancement, is white. It's like looking for a snowball in a snowstorm. You have to suppress the fat. So right there, MRI orbits and chiasm and with and without contrast with that fat suppression in a high field unit. Can't use an open MRI, it's not sensitive enough. Now, optic neuritis, suspect MS. MRI the orbits and chiasm with and without contrast with fat suppression. That's number one. Number two, MRI brain with and without contrast, looking for white matter lesions. Horner syndrome, brain MRI with and without contrast, CT angiography or MR angiography of the head and neck looking for cerebral artery dissection, MRI of the chest with lung apex and brachial plexus looking for lung cancer. If you can't remember all that, just order a Horner's protocol or tell them to image the sympathetic plexus. That's Horner syndrome. Suspected aneurysm, third nerve palsy, CTA and a CT with an MRA and an MRI. Concentration, the circle of Willis, tell them what you're looking for. Now, if you think there's a high risk of aneurysm, send them the ER and tell them what to do. But don't just send the patient to the ER without helping them. They won't get it right. They'll do a non-contrast enhanced CT of the brain. It's normal. They'll release them. So keep this one slide. This should be a nice cheat sheet that you can use when you have to neuroimage. So what to order, how, and why. So going back to third nerve palsy anatomy, the pupillomotor fibers travel with the third nerve in subarachnoid space here, and they coat the nerve, so they're especially vulnerable to compression from the outside. So a dilated pupil is telling you something's compressing, and it could be an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery. Now, if they have if they have a diabetic infarct, that core of the nerve is going to be affected, but there's such a rich anastomotic watershed blood supply to the superficial pupils, uh, pupil normal fibers, the pupils are normal. So normal people tell you it's a vascular infarct, usually. Dilated people tell you it's a compression. Now, you're not going to get compression, give you an isolated dilated pupil alone. It'll involve the nerve, it'll involve motility, it'll involve the, the lid. People involved third nerve palsies are going to be 
posterior communicating artery aneurysms will prove otherwise. Now, an incomplete or partial is also an aneurysm, like this woman here, a little bit of ptosis, a little bit of uh, ophthalmoparesis, but it's not complete. That's most likely an aneurysm that is developing and growing. So this is, this is also an emergency. Now, 30% of third nerve palsies are caused by aneurysm. I don't need to leave this thinking that I, I'm telling you, Joe said it's a one in three chance that it's an aneurysm. And that's not what I'm saying. It all depends on the patient profile. There are some patients who, based upon the clinical appearance, have a much less chance of having an aneurysm. There are other patients who have a much greater chance of having an aneurysm. They have to come from somewhere, about a third come from aneurysm, third nerve palsies, but it doesn't mean your patient has a one in three chance. It might be more, it might be less. Pain is pain. It's only helpful when it's not present. Aneurysms are always painful. They leak and they bleed and they irritate the meninges. Diabetic infarcts are painful 90% of the time. So if pain is not there, it's kind of helpful. But you can't characterize the pain as being thunderclap pain or mild headache and you know say it's, it's vascular or aneurysm. That you can't do. Pain is only helpful when it's not there. Pain is pain. Vasculopathic thirds will resolve in time without sequelae. Aneurysms will rupture in time with sequelae. 20% of patients will die within 48 hours from rupture of the aneurysm. Overall, half these patients will die. The average time from onset to rupture is about 29 days. Many patients never make the hospital. Now, if the aneurysm ruptures, you know, there's about a 5% surgical mortality, and they're going to be functionally impaired afterwards. If the aneurysm is unruptured, you know, there's generally no mortality, and, and patients can, can recover and about half will actually recover third nerve, third nerve function. And how these patients treated, you know, they can be treated with a craniotomy and an aneurysm clip, like you're clipping a bag of potato chips, or they'll go, go through the femoral artery, the catheter, they'll put a stent in this area right here, and they'll squeeze these coils in like, like toothpaste, so blood can't get in there, keeps the vessel open. And I've always said that the, you know, these are, these are two procedures that are relatively straightforward and simple for a skilled neurosurgeon. And interestingly, a couple of months ago, I had a retired neurosurgeon. So I, I engaged her in, in conversation about this. And, you know, she told me what I knew is that the, the aneurysm clips aren't you, you really used that, that often. Uh, everything is being done endovascularly. And she said, no, it's actually kind of hard that, you know, you open up the skull and it's bloody and you, know, you, you, you remove the dirt and it's bloody. And a lot of times these aneurysms pop. Now you get all this blood all over the place. It's, it's, a, it's a pain. Never dilate a patient with third nerve palsy because, you know, somebody else is going to be looking at, at that patient and they're going to need to know what the status of the pupil is. So our rules for imaging, we talked about this. They're, they're ultimately going to get uh, digital subtraction and geography in the hospital. But CT and CTA is actually preferred non-invasive imaging for third nerve palsy. And usually followed by MRI and MRA. But we have to have an A in there. There's got to be like MRA or CTA looking for an A aneurysm. A study recently came out that showed, you know, in what in one center, a tertiary neuro-ophthalmology department, they looked at about uh, a 10-year span. They saw the majority of third nerve palsy patients don't get the appropriate urgent imaging. You know, the patient may actually be diagnosed correctly, but the, uh, there's a delay in getting the neuroimaging because the referring physicians don't really appreciate the, uh, the urgency of it. Here's a different patient with a different prognosis. She's 63 year old female, diabetic and hypertensive, both poorly controlled, suddenly develops retroorbital pain. And we look at it, and the funny thing is, they're not complaining about the double vision. She's not complaining that she can't open her eyelids. She's complaining about the pain. But she's got a complete ptosis. Lift her eyelids. She cannot look up, cannot look down. She cannot adduct her eye. 
She can abduct her eye. So she's got a complete third nerve palsy. Her pupils were normal and symmetrical. She had numerous vasculopathic risk factors. How many which is, are on there a lot? Uh, so, got it. Got it. So which is better, one or two? She resolved over several weeks, no complications. Hospitalized 23 days, two neurosurgical procedures, but he did live. Always suspect the worst. I was talking about this somewhere out west in, in OD in the audience cap and told us about a, a patient with a third nerve palsy in their practice. I don't, I don't know about the status of the pupil. They diagnosed the third nerve. They referred to an ophthalmologist the next day. Unfortunately, the patient died from a subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, overnight. Now, if they have vasculopathic risk factors, does that help? Well, it kind of helps. You know, hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerosis, they're all very common. They don't protect against an aneurysm. So the answer is, no, it doesn't really help that much, but I, guess I get real nervous when they're not there. Does it, being acute help? Well, kind of yes and no. Aneurysmal expansion is usually pretty apoplectic, but slowly evolving cases have been reported. So chronic and improving is less worrisome. Resolved without recurrence is definitely the best. So aneurysm risk assessment, an isolated third nerve palsy, isolated dilated pupil, no lid, no motility dysfunction, there's no risk of aneurysm. A complete third nerve palsy with a normal pupil in an older person with vasculopathic risk factor, low risk of aneurysm. A partial third nerve palsy with a normal pupil is a high risk of aneurysm, and a pupil involved third is an emergency. Joe, stay right there on that uh, slide. Mm -hmm. um, and then we got some questions in the chat box and we can work backwards. So I'm going to start with, that's why I think this would be perfect here, this slide while you leave it up. It says incomplete palsy, meaning cranial nerve three palsy without pupil involvement, question mark. So an eye is down and out with ptosis, question mark. So they're questioning the incomplete palsy meaning. Good question. It's not just a medial rectus palsy. It's not just a superior rectus that the stuff doesn't happen. It's a ptosis, but not a complete ptosis. They can adduct their eye a little bit. They can elevate their eye a little bit. They can depress their eye a little bit. It's not a complete frozen. That's a partial. And that's probably an expanding aneurysm. Excellent question. Next one, Greg. Yeah, just going backwards, this goes back whenever you're asking what was wrong with the, uh, or, you know, where, where were the errors in the imaging ordering and someone put angiogram, this is not partial, so uh, MRI needed, brain ischemia, and then MRA, those were the answers that rolled in. That's it, and you need an A to find an A, you got to tell them to look for the uh, goes back to the doxycycline, it says, does the association with minnow change your decision-making on long-term doxy use in rosacea and meibomian gland dysfunction patients? Only in those patients where it actually happens, but no, I, I, I don't hesitate to use it. And I'm gonna jump in and, and, and just echo, yes, there's no concern. Um, I'm also going to point out that it's just not pseudotumor cerebri or swollen nerve heads that this can cause. I challenge everyone that has a computer to type in minocycline and hyperpigmentation into Google or whatever browser you use, those two words, hit enter and see what can happen is you can get all kinds of pigmentations from head to toe, which I've created in patients and found in patients just asking them, hey, I see you're on Doxy getting any strange pigmentations. The other would be it can enhance Coumadin and it can enhance Digoxin. And again, when those patients come in, and we have these talks not to discourage you. That's why I think this is a great question. Not to discourage you from prescribing these medications, but knowing them. When I see someone that's on Coumadin and I say, hey, look, I'm going to put you on this medication. I'm going to, who put you on here? Oh, it's my internist or, you know, the cardiologist. I call them up and, you know, I say, look, I'm going to put them on. They're like, oh, it's, it's an antibiotic. It won't mess up their, you know, their anticoagulation. I go, well, that's why I'm calling you because this is more of a skin problem, acting like a dermatologist, treating their meibomian gland dysfunction. The same thing with 
when you work with a cardiologist with digoxin. Oh, it's an antibiotic. Don't worry. It won't affect their dig levels in two weeks. All right. Well, that's why I'm calling you again is because this is a, a uh, skin condition. I'm working in it as like a dermatologist treating these oil glands. Oh, they're like, okay, we'll get their dig, dig levels checked. So this is, you know, the, all of these conditions that we talked about, the swollen nerves, the Coumadin, the digoxin, the hyperpigmentation, they don't stop us uh, from prescribing us. We just know that we can have this and give the patient the, you know, the, the informed consent, in a sense, to be using this medication and monitor to them appropriately. Very good, Greg. Oh, hold on one second. Oh, this, it was just a thank you about the incomplete. So that was okay. a thank you to you, Joe. Very good. Well, that covers three of the big emergencies. Of course, there could be others, but uh, these are three of the big ones. 39-year-old male, history of migraine, develops a new and worsening headache. He goes to the emergency room where he was admitted and he underwent a non-contrast enhanced uh, CT and MRI, which were interpreted as normal. This was the headache protocol for the hospital. So his headache was attributed to migraine. He was medicated uh, as such and, and, and discharged. Now, he himself felt that it wasn't the typical migraine. Now, three days later, he develops a horizontal and vertical double vision. And he looks like this. And you can see he's got a ptosis here and the eye is a little exotropic. He cannot look to the left. He cannot adduct. He has difficulty looking up or down, but he can. And he cannot look out. So we have a partial third. We have a sixth. I'm not gonna get into cyclical deviations here. That brings me to polling question number four, Greg, if you can launch that for me. Where is the patient's problem located? Somewhere in the brain, in the orbit. Nowhere, because the scans were normal. Two scans were normal. And I don't know. That's why I'm here. Which is an acceptable answer. No other questions in the chat box? Okay. I will launch right now, I guess, the handout one more time and apologize for the 645 link being aired, but uh, that's been resolved for the post event emails. And there it is. And I'll put my email address in there. I had a few people uh, say that they can't get it via chat. So I'll put my email in here. And if you just want me to send it to you, send me an email and I'll send it real quickly to you. There it is there. All right, I think for the end, the... end the poll. Yep. Share the Somewhere results. in the brain, somewhere in the orbit, nowhere, because the scans are normal, and they're always right. The cabinet of sinus, or I don't know, that's why I'm here. And I think the majority of patients actually did get the, uh, the right answer. We have to consider cavernous sinus. Well, his acuity and his visual fields were actually normal. He had a right pupil sparing external partial third nerve palsy, concurrent sixth nerve palsy, complaint of worsening headache and lethargy. Where is the lesion? Well, let's contact the radiologist for a second reading. And I actually did this. This, this was an ersatz telemedicine. When I say telemedicine, this was during lockdown. This was seen by one of my former residents who got into the weeds with, with this double vision patient, he called me. So he was seeing the patient as an emergency basis and asked me my opinion. So uh, I gave it to him. He, he filmed it and sent it to me uh, on my iPhone. They said, we got to call the, the radiologist. And the radiologist said, nope. Uh, and I said, look in the cavernous sinus. And he's looking and said, nope, cavernous sinus is fine. Everything's good. Nope, there, everything's good. Yeah, yeah, well, the pituitary gland does look a little chubby. Ba -ba 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 the pituitary again looks a little chubby. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to call the patient, get the patient back into the emergency room and get him rescanned. Contrast enhanced MRI of the, of the, of the, of the paracellar area. MRI, MRA rule out intercavernous aneurysm and pituitary ap apoplexy. He had a pituitary macro, a macro adenoma, which hemorrhaged and he had a pituitary apoplexy. It spread into the right cavernous sinus and also was beginning to spread into the left cavernous sinus. The odd thing is it went lateral. It did not go vertical. It did not compress the chiasm, hence the normal visual field. 
He was immediately admitted for endocrinological and neurosurgical evaluation. He had a pituitary apoplexy. It's a severe, potentially fatal condition. About 12% of pituitary adenomas are, are going to undergo an apoplexy. These are patients who are going to have headache, vomiting, visual impairment, field loss, ophthalmoparesis, altered mental state, altered consci consciousness, lethargy, and a panhypopituitarism. The hemodynamic instability is going to result from adrenocorticotrophic hormone deficiency, and this can be fatal. This is a potentially fatal disease. So what is it? New onset headache, lethargy, somnolence, altered mentation, ophthalmoparesis, loss of visual field. In this case, there's no loss of visual field. This is a rapid expansion due to hemorrhage or infarction of a known or unknown pituitary adenoma. Most common presenting symptom, headache. And it's often frontal or retroorbital. Now, pituitary apoplexy is often overlooked as a possible cause of these thunderclap headaches. When you think about venous sinus thrombosis, cervical artery dissection, subarachnoid hemorrhage, people don't think about apoplexy. About half of these patients will have visual abnormalities. Sometimes it's blurred vision, field loss. Cranial neuropathies, cranial nerve three is most common, followed by, by six. Uh, number six is, is common, followed by three. The field defects can be a new onset or sudden onset by temporal, by temporal uh, defect, and they can also have a facial weakness. Most of these symptomatic patients uh, for a headache are going to go undergo CT scanning in the emergency room because they're looking for acute intracranial hemorrhage. But the acute hemorrhage infarction, you know, can easily be seen uh, from the pituitary gland on a CT. Now, non-hemorrhagic infarcts are not going to show up uh, as, as abnormal without intravenous con contrast. MRI with contrast is the most effective imaging in case, in case of a suspected pituitary uh, apoplexy. And MRI is superior to, uh, to CT scan. So he had a normal CT, he had a normal MRI because they're looking for headache. This is their headache protocol. Even when we told them where to look, they still didn't find it. We had to re-image the patient urgently, tell them exactly what to look for, and then they easily found it. The outcome is positive in most, in most cases. They can undergo uh, hormone replacement, and this will stabilize the patient. They can also undergo surgical decompression, which is a transphenoidal trans, trans or subfrontal uh, transcranial approach. Now, patients who have visual impairment or neuroophthalmic dysfunction are probably going to be selected for surgery. Now, this was during COVID, so he was medically stabilized. And the surgery was delayed and, uh, until uh, we started getting a little further into the, uh, the pandemic. And then he underwent uh, surgical decompression and actually has done quite well. So pituitary apoplexy, they, they may have a known tumor or it's the first sign of an unknown tumor. It is a new onset headache, lethargy, somnolence, altered mentation, ophthalmoparesis, vision loss, field loss. In this case, there's no field loss, but this is a potentially fatal disease. So we covered a lot of them now. We covered four of the five. And I'm going to move on to a 78-year-old female who has a sudden onset of ptosis in her left eye immediately after parathyroid surgery. Her son was driving her home from parathyroid surgery. There's her incision. She had three adenomas removed from uh, her parathyroid. And he noticed her eyelid was uh, was actually was drooping. So she got a drooping eyelid. Figures probably anesthesia. She gets up the next day. It's still drooping. Calls a surgeon. Sends her to the ER immediately. Worries that she's having a stroke. Where the what do they do in the ER? They do a drum roll, please. A non-contrast enhanced CT of the brain. She has no hemorrhagic infarcts. They release her. She comes to see me, it's Friday, it's one of the last patients of the day and she sees me and she has a, she has a Horner syndrome. I put iopidine in her eye, 
This is pre-iapidine. Here's post-iapidine. Bing. Problem solved. There it is. Okay, that's that's what she has. She has a Horner syndrome. She's had neck surgery. You know, neck trauma, neck sur you know, neck surgery, parasympathetic dysfunction. It's like cookies and cream. What I don't like, she has headache and eye pain. That shouldn't be happening afterwards. And I, I discussed the possibility of carotid dissection. She won't hear of it. I wanted to go to the ER. I've been there this morning. I'm normal. They didn't do the right scan. She starts to cry. She's very upset. She's still fatigued from, uh, from, her, from her surgery the day before. She has not recovered. She will not go to the ER. Then she drops, uh, she drops the bomb on me. She's there with her son. She said, you're, but you're, you're an optometrist, right? I'm not sure if she used you're an optometrist or you're just an optometrist. But she used, she dropped the optometry bomb. He said, well, what about the ophthalmologist? Can I see one of your ophthalmologists? I said, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to want you to go to the ER. And she was actually a, a retired nurse. So she, 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 knew, she knew some medicine. She said, what about a neuro-ophthalmologist? Can I see a neuro-ophthalmologist? I said, of course you can see a neuro-ophthalmologist. Can I see a neuro-ophthalmologist now? And she said, I said, no. Why can't I see a neuro-ophthalmologist now? It's 4.40 on a Friday. I'm the best you're going to get today. So she won't go to the ER. I think she has a, I'm worried about a carotid dissection. Will you take aspirin? Yes. Okay. So she agrees to take aspirin. I call the next day. She's still alive. She feels better. She still has headache. She won't go back to ER. She actually calls her ophthalmologist uh, in Buffalo. I'm in Florida. She's a snowbird. And she's asking him, and, and to his credit, he says, either do what he wants you to do or don't waste his time. So she comes back and a couple of days later, she agrees to get, uh, get neuroimaging. I order an MRA and it comes back pow, she had a carotid dissection. So knock on wood, we did the aspirin therapy and that prevented her from having a stroke. That was very important, uh, I think. And ultimately next day, I got her into the hands of stroke neurology. Now, when we have a patient like these, you know, what are the causes? You have, you know, migraine headache can do it, direct surgical trauma to the nerve can do it, carotid dissection can do it, lung cancer. I can tell you right now, lung cancers are not that common and they have a relatively poor, almost uniformly poor prognosis. So these are people that we get into the healthcare system, but what we have to worry more about is carotid dissection. Carotid dissection is a linear tear in the vessel wall. It can happen, surgical trauma, chiropractic manipulation, whiplash, or it can happen spontaneously. When this linear tear happens, there will be a, a thrombus that will form. And the problem here is thrombus can lead to embolus, which can lead to stroke. When you ever have a, a new onset Horner syndrome that is painful, eye pain, neck pain, head pain, result of neck trauma, we have to consider carotid dissection. These are people who are at significant immediate risk of cerebral vascular accident. Of those patients that go on to cerebral vascular accident, 52% go within six days. Two thirds within the first week, nearly 90% within two weeks. After that, after 31 days, there's virtually no risk of stroke. The vessel wall has repaired itself. These people need supportive therapy. They need anticoagulant therapy, antiplatelet, anti uh, need to be heparized, aspirin therapy. And it's not clear if aspirin or, or warfarin is actually better for these patients. That, that still is unknown. But after about 31 days, the vessel wall has repaired itself. They're gonna, they're, you know, they don't need neurosurgery. They don't need vascular surgery. But a new onset painful horners, if you think it's carotid dissection, should go right to the emergency room and tell them what to do and what to look for. So that really kind of caught, covers all our emergencies. But I do want to share with you in our last 10 to 15 minutes uh, some more neuroophthalmic pearls. 
If you listen to the patient, they will tell you what their diagnosis is. And a lot of times, I hate to say, like in my practice, I, I see virtually all the neuro-ophthalmic disease because nobody else wants to do it. And I, I, have a, I have a certain experience and comfort level with it. And usually when I see it, it's already come from one of my colleagues who's done already an excellent ophthalmic evaluation. So there's very little I actually have to look for. I almost feel like a charlatan. I'll do a biomicroscopic examination just so they feel I've done something, but mostly I'm just listening to them. And they will tell me what's wrong. She's a 73-year-old female who complained of a swollen left eyelid for three, for three months. I heard her checking in. Uh, I was standing behind my front desk. I heard her check in. She sounded very petulant. She turned out to be a wonderful person she, and we have a great relationship. But I heard her say, I'm not going back to my other doctor. They're just not listening to me. So as I heard her say that several times, I vowed to myself, well, all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna listen to her. She's a highly allergic patient. She had pain, uh, ear pain and ear blockage on the right side of her face while she was gardening. She thinks she got something into her eye. She's been with a doctor for, for about three months. She's been given xylit, azacite, oral antihistamine, hot and cold compresses, no improvement. Now, to her credit, her primary care physician tested her for giant cell arteritis, which was negative, and is all a presumed allergic reaction, but it's, there's no itching, it's persistent, and it's unilateral. Now she's hypothyroid and a smoker. And I take a look and she looks like this. I just sat there and just let, let, let her tell me the story. She went through everything in detail. And as I'm looking at it, I realized, I've seen this before. I had to tell her, I said, You're, you don't have a swollen eyelid. You've got a totic eyelid. You've got Horner's syndrome. Preopidine, she's frowning. post look at that lid come up. She's smiling. She's happy. There's our diagnosis. And of course, I worked with her with her uh, internist. We got all the imaging done on her. And ultimately, I think the best, uh, best uh, diagnosis she's doing quite well. We found nothing definitive. It was, either, it was either otitis media or a healed dissection. 25-year-old woman involved in a minor auto accident. I'm not going to go through anything in detail. Very mild, just a very mild fender bender. Nobody was injured. Everybody walked away, everybody was fine, no head trauma, next day she has double vision. And the question is, you know, what's the most likely cause? Is it subarachnoid hemorrhage, third nerve palsy, orbital fracture, fourth nerve palsy, sixth nerve palsy, and we take a look, she has clearly a right hyperdeviation, and she had a new onset fourth nerve palsy caused by a relatively mild trauma. And because the, third, the fourth nerve decusates the anterior medullary velum and goes around the brain stem, it is long, it's exposed, and it's very prone to trauma. Now, long-standing fourth nerve palsies can present with double vision from decompensation. And we always look at, look for the head tilt and look, look at, uh, at old photographs. And always remember the rule of 40, 30, 20, 10. 40% 40 are traumatic, 30% are idiopathic, 20% are vascular, and 10% is something bad like a CNS lesion. And you can see 90% of these patients are gonna end well for you. Sometimes it doesn't end so well. He's a 73 year old male who complained of new onset vertical double vision. He had a fourth nerve palsy, very clear. Two prism diopters based down. Beautiful. I feel much better. And he also said, you know, Doc, I also noticed my gripper is off. He said, like, my, you know, my, my left hand, I'm off, you know, it just doesn't feel strong. So he's got mild left hand weakness and a fourth nerve palsy, or we can say a fourth nerve palsy and upper extremity uh, weakness. Now his medical history, he's got, he's being treated for lung cancer. He's on maintenance chemotherapy. In my entire career, this is probably the, the only fourth nerve palsy I can think of that I actually neuroimaged. I saw him on a Thursday. By Monday, he was in hospice. He had brain metastasis. 
Fourth nerve palsy, but it was complicated. He had multiple brain meds. Never diagnose idiopathic or ischemic anything in a patient with a history of cancer. Now, there's a big difference between uh, a woman treated 25 years ago with mastectomy for breast cancer and a man treated last year for prostate cancer, but cancer is cancer until proven otherwise. He's a 77-year-old male. He and his sister come down from the north insisting on cataract surgery. He's got 2040 and 2070 vision commensurate with his cataracts. He's got a chronic horizontal double vision, which has recently gotten worse over the last two weeks. He has a left abduction deficit by about 40%. Now, medical history, inoperable chondral sarcoma with lysis of the clivus, extending to the left petrix apex and occipital condyle with sphenoidal, ethmoidal, and temporal bone involvement. There is the longstanding horizontal double vision. There's compression to the jugular vein. He's undergone at least 50 radiation treatments. It's, it's inoperable. He's got a vocal paralysis. He's, he's also got a paralysis of, of 9, 10, and 12. But this is nuance that worsening. I imaged, I got imaging, he had a pacemaker, so I had to use uh, CT with contrast. He had new, new soft mass in his left nasal pharynx. He had squamous cell carcinoma. And this was a patient with a sixth nerve palsy worsened by cancer because he's got a history of cancer. Now I'm gonna skip through a few things. I'm gonna to talk to you about six nerve palsy because we're, we're, running, we're running out of time here. So do you well, want the questions that have rolled in or do you wanna do this now? Let me just wrap up six. Okay, good. There, there's, there's, two, there's actually two key things to remember about six nerve palsies. Okay. If you're imaging a six nerve palsy, the two places a tumor can hide is at the base of the pons and the cavernous sinus. So when imaging or recommending imaging, that's where you tell the radiology to look for, the base of the pons or the cavernous sinus. Now, if you're watching a presumptive ischemic vascular six nerve palsy and you're wrong, it isn't diabetes or hypertension, you likely have not hurt the patient. There's nothing that is going to urgently kill a, six, a person with six nerve palsy. Greg, hit me with the questions. So the first one is, it says on slide 88, lung cancer can lead to Horner's question mark. Yes. Because the oculosympathetic plexus is going to climb over the clivus, it's, it's going to climb over the apex of the of the lung, and this is where it, this is where it involves the the pancos tumor, is a tumor of the apex of the lung and the apical chest wall, and that is the same area that we're going to be seeing the oculosympathetic plexus traveling through. So yes, and that coast tumor can be, can cause a Horner syndrome. Yeah. And that's whenever, you know, I thought whenever, you know, got an optometry school, I thought I was going to be seeing myasthenia gravis patients uh, or not myasthenia gravis, but uh, Alos Daniels patients uh, every day, Marfan's patients every day. And, and the Horners being from, from, Pancos. Now they can occur, but we usually we see those from carotid dissection. Um, so yes, but the answer is yes to echo what Joe said. Joe, there's a question in here private. Yes. It says, how many milligrams of aspirin? So I'm not sure where that was. It was at 837. So go back about nine minutes. No, I know exactly what it is. How many milligrams of aspirin for a suspected carotid dissection? And this is, this is a great question. If you think that the patient has a carotid dissection, and there's no contraindication to using aspirin. Give it to him. You know, start him off when you send him off the ER. You know, start him on aspirin, 81 milligrams. I started her on 81 milligrams because I didn't know she had a dissection. When I found out she had a dissection, I increased her to 325 milligrams, which is full strength aspirin, and got her into stroke neurology. But you can start with 81. Excellent question. I think this is more of a comment here. It says, 
judo or bjj which is brazilian jiu-jitsu on young adults and carotid dissection heard of a few cases of stroke or deaths and that is that a question or a statement it sounds like a statement i agree yeah i think it's more statement getting validation yeah, absolutely all right here's one here that says can you go over how you would expect a primary care physician or neurologist to manage pseudotumor due to the high BMI long-term question mark? I have heard weight loss from patients on follow-up through pa though patients do not always lose weight. Weight loss is, is a primary treatment that, and that's what they need. Now they may need to have ap appetite suppressants. They may need personal trainers. They may need dietitians. But weight loss is the is, is a primary treatment. Long-term diamox is just is this going to make a patient sick? And I've actually had patient probably the N is two or three that went through gastric bypass. So I guess that was a little bit maybe maybe end stage of trying everything. But I've had two or three patients that had pseudotumor that ended up with gastric bypass. Well, as I alert, alluded to earlier, a lot of neurop is neurop nonsense. And this is a nice example. We, we, you kind of just listen to the patient and they'll tell you, they'll tell you what's wrong. He's a 70 year old male who had an acute onset diplopia, blurred vision and dilated pupils. He went to the emergency department and they worked him up for a stroke. Now he had a CT, CTA, MR, M, uh, MRI, M, sorry, should, should say, say MRA. And he brought the reports and everything had been done. They're all normal. So there's nothing else I'm gonna do here. They, he had the right things done. And he was referred to me by another optometrist in my practice who had, had, had done a very thorough examination. So I've got very little to do. Now, when I see him a couple of days after she had seen him, you know, he said his vision was improving. He felt his pupils were dilated. They looked normal to me. His wife said, no, they're better. He had endpoint end point nystagmus. And he had a very nonspecific horizontal diploma that, that really didn't match out anywhere. Now, what's the good thing here? I mean, what are the bad things? He's got pupil dilation. He's got nystagmus. He's got double vision. What's good here? It's getting better. You say everything seems to be getting better. It's still happening, but it's getting better. Now, he's on an anti-muscarinic for, 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 bladder, for bladder reasons, but nothing has changed there. Madriasis and blurred vision, I can tell you right now, always think toxicity. So I don't have much to do. I just sat there and listened to him and his wife. And then she, they, they told me immediately before they had driven from Connecticut down to Sarasota virtually in, in, in one trip, straight through. They shifted off driving. They were, you know, they, they were sleeping in the car. And I can tell you right now, here's a rule. Everything is worse when you're tired. Didn't stop. He said, the only time they stopped, he said, 7-Eleven was having a sale on big gulps. And he could get a big gulp and get it refilled anywhere for 49 cents. So the only time he, he ever stopped to uh, stop was to, uh, to get a new big gulp and to get rid of the last old big gulp uh, and, and urinate. So I imagine he probably looks like this fellow right here with that big gulp. And when I, when he added up, he had drink, he had drunk about three liters of diet, Dr. Pepper. Now I learned from a colleague and friend, Dr. Robert Hasty, an internist, when a patient tells you what they, what they ingest, always triple it. Toxicity, right? This, this is an issue of toxicity. What do I do? Well, not much of anything. So you're getting better. I'm going to see you back in a week. Anything gets worse, give me a call. Calls me about three days later, said, I'm canceling my appointment. Everything's fine. I'm normal. Just listen to him. Take care with best of care. I think this is actually the, uh, the motto for this, this medicine for, for overactive bladder. She was a 56-year-old female who I was treating for ocular hypertension, and her, med her intraocular pressure starts to, uh, to elevate. I add a medicine, it elevates. And I add another medicine, it elevates. And I stop her medicine, it goes sky high. Then one day she calls and tells me her, her, her pupils are dilating and vision's blurred. Well, that's toxicity. So we bring her in, we, we're going through everything. What we figure out is 
her doctor had just increased her from five milligrams to 10 milligrams of Vesicare. Now, five milligram and 10 milligram tablets looked alike. She thought she it was given five milligrams when she was given 10. And she thought to double dose, she would just take two of them. So she went from five to 40 milligrams and found herself in a toxic situation. And here's the case of the curbside consult. There was actually at a conference in Trinidad that was dealing with neurology. And this woman, she was a wife of the society president. She sat down with me uh, at a meal and said, you know, she, she wanted my opinion. She said she was very, very anxious. She was having memory loss and she lost her smell and taste. And this is pre-COVID, so we didn't know anything about this. And she was being worked up for neurodegenerative conditions. She was really worried about this and she had something wrong with her. And I find out she had tonsillectomy about two months earlier with some pain. She had some, some, some facial and persistent jaw pain, had been seen by multiple specialists, including neurology, ENT, and a primary care physician on multiple medications, including at least two oral antibiotics. And I can tell you, there is this medicine I, I, I use a lot of to protect my voice when I, get, when I, when I start getting uh, a mucus buildup called mu uh, mucinex. I'm sure many, many people have used it. After three doses, I lose my, 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 my sense of taste. So what, what, what was my suggestion? She went to an oral facial surgeon who diagnosed her with TMJ. At my recommendation, she stopped all of her medicines and she recovered. It was just toxicity. So it's not always a brain tumor. So you should always also think about medication toxicity. And toxicities that we, that we can, need to know about, well, ethambutol, that can give you toxic optic neuropathy. Amiodarone or Pacerone can give you toxic optic neuropathy. Start looking for the patients on these medicines for unexplained vision loss and don't wait till they get 2200. Vigabatrin, this is an anticonvulsant for focal epilepsy in children two years of age and older, causes profound field loss. But the most important thing, Pearl, I can give you is blurred vision and dilated pupils, they're taken in something that's not agreeing with them. So I'm almost out of time. I'm going to wrap up with my final Pearl. Immediately referring to the emergency department is acceptable management if you are willing to help. Don't just send them there because they will get a non-contrast enhanced brain MRI. If it's normal, they are dismissed. When I'm on call, we get calls from the hospital. Hey, can I run a case by you? I've got a question. Can I run a case by you? What's best handled in the emergency department? Suspected giant cell arteritis. They can get the blood test. They can get the steroids on bar immediately. Tell them what to do and what to look for. Suspected aneurysm. Neurosurgical consult. Tell them what to look for, where to look for it. Suspected papilledema. MRI, MRV. Suspected pituitary apoplexy. Suspected carotid dissection. And of course, central retinal artery occlusion, branch retinal artery occlusion, or transient ischemic attack where they briefly lose vision in one eye and it comes back. These are patients who are at risk of stroke. They need to go to a stroke unit immediately. So these are all well handled in the emergency department if you are willing to help. Write a note, give chart notes, call somebody, give them your phone number so somebody can call you. If you're willing to help, we can, we can help other physicians save these patients. So with that, Greg, I think I'm done. If there are any questions, I'll take those. So the first one that's in there says, do you recommend cocaine tests? And a side comment is hard to get except on the street, end of side comment. So do you recommend cocaine tests for recent onset Ptosis slash anisocoria, iopidine false or early? No, I don't recommend cocaine. Iopidine is so much easier to use and it has to be iopidine. It can't be bromonidine. It can't be phenylephrine. It can't be upneak. It has to be iopidine, a half percent. I always have it in the office, maybe expired, but at least I have it. 
uh, it's even it is even more diagnostic than cocaine testing. Another one says one article read concerning anterior ischemic optic neuropathy said that if sus suspicions are strong for giant cell, but the temporal body, temporal artery biopsy is normal, then the temporal artery on the non-affected side should be biopsied. Your thoughts? Yes, agree. And the only reason that we're biopsying the temporal artery is it's, it's accessible and expendable. And it, it can be normal because of a skip lesion, because the, the pathologist didn't read it right. Uh, another pathologist may, may recognize something else. Focal disruption of the intima means if they got the disease, there is no inflammatory cells there any longer. They can easily be, be misread, or sometimes you, know, you get the report back, temporal vein uh, normal, you idiot. So yes, both, if, if, if you str have strong suspicions, it can be done on both sides. Can you have a mild APD secondary to cornea findings like severe cornea edema? The answer is no. You'd have to have almost a complete corneal opacification to even give you a, a pseudo APD. It's not really, it's not really a true APD. I mean, it is. It's the apparent system, but corneal edema, even a even a hypermature cataract, shouldn't give you much of an APD, if at all. And being that I was able to sit and digest that question for a little bit, you know, if a patient has a lot of cornea trauma, cornea edema they're probably going to have a lot of inflammation, which as you know, with inflammation, you can get now a pupil that dilates, maybe becomes a little sluggish. So for it to be APD, no, for a cornea, you know, for a severe cornea edema, again, dilation, uveitis, it's not truly an APD, but you can probably get some pupillary sluggishness, as Joe said, or maybe a little bit of anisocoria because of the inflammation. All right. Do you see dilated pupils and blurred vision with Wellbutrin and Zoloft? Typically, no, but medicines such as that, if they are overdosed, you can get that. Anti-muscarinics, uh, for other things, bladder control, yes, you can, you know, especially if they're over, over, overdosed or, 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 or they exceed their, their dosing, you can definitely get that. Uh, I'll probably change this question a little bit, but it says, what is the exact me mechanism with mucinex toxicity and dilated pupils or just what is the mechanism with mucinex? Oh, the, the answer is, I don't know. I didn't say mucinex will give dilated pupil. For me personally, three doses of mucinex, I lose my sense of taste. I don't know why. In a patient, uh, in a case of a patient allergic to aspirin, what do you recommend instead of suspecting in, in if you're suspecting carotid dissection of warfarin or any other anticoagulant? Those are not medicines that, that, that I, that I prescribe. Uh, I will, I will leave that to the ER physician. So if they're allergic to aspirin, don't, don't do anything, just get them to the ER. Is that what? Exactly. Okay. I'm just trying to go through your virtual thank yous here. I think if you want to open up the chat and I'll switch over, if you want to see if anything else comes in, I'll share the screen here. I've get, stopped sharing. And uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. So I'll say, you know, thanks, Joe, for taking, you know, neuro uh, certainly creates a lot of anxiety out there. And I know you referenced it to a scleral lens, but, um, you know, and I feel the same way. It's a great analogy, but I think we all can help with these neuro op patients. And especially, I think one of your biggest is help the PCP, help the neuro, help them out at the hospital. We all can do this. We all can tell them and be a part of their team when it comes to these neuro. So thanks for taking something that maybe causes us heartburn and making it so that it 